Hey everyone, me again. So today I felt like doing a sequel to my Milserp fakery video. Uh, this is where I discuss the, you know, some of the most common types of Milserp or military firearm fakery you may encounter. If you haven't seen the original video, I'll put the uh, link in the description below. Uh, but uh, the reason for the sequel, of course, is that uh, partly because I, I uh, thought of some additional examples of, of common fakery uh, that, that could be out there that, you know, didn't occur to me at the time of the last video. And also I got some helpful comments in the comment section that reminded me of some other stuff to, to watch out for as well that I thought was definitely worth including. So uh, hence the sequel. Of course, the same disclaimers do apply just because something is uh, quote unquote fake or at least not original. It uh, doesn't mean it was manufactured with the intent to deceive you. Um, it, of course, still can if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, and especially if you're dealing with a dishonest seller or maybe the seller doesn't know what they're looking at. And secondly, of course, uh, just because something isn't, you know, quote unquote, uh, real, doesn't mean that it's not necessarily worth owning. Again, it's just about knowing what you're looking at and paying the right price. So that having been said, uh, let's get started. For number one, we have the modern reproduction. Sometimes there's just enough demand for some of these old historic firearms that uh, modern manufacturers actually consider it commercially viable to just produce these old designs into the modern day. Um, common examples include things like the M1 carbine. There's been a couple manufacturers that have been producing them into the modern day. Of course, lots of makers uh, produce GI style 1911s. And in front of us, we have a, a new production version of the Winchester 1892. Uh, how exact these things are will vary, of course, significantly. Some of them are very easy to identify from the real thing. Uh, some of them less so. Some of them are, you know, relatively exact copies. For instance, uh, Auto Ordnance claims that their M1 carbine is so close to the real thing that 95% of parts will interchange. I don't know how true that is, but, it, it, you know, um, some of them really are genuinely quite close. Uh, the quality on this stuff will tend to vary. Uh, some of it, you know, is really best avoided, and some of it's really not too terrible. But the point is, it's not original, and if you really don't know what you're looking for uh, or looking at, um, you could make that mistake. I just recently I saw a listing online for an M1 carbine, and it really all it said was M1 carbine, X amount of dollars, excellent condition, includes one magazine. I don't know if that seller was being, you know, deliberately vague or they were just kind of thoughtless, but from the pictures you could judge that it was a new production one, but uh, somebody could certainly end up buying that by mistake, thinking that uh, they got a piece of history and really they got something that was, you know, made in 2008 or something like that. So definitely check manufacturer's marks, uh, and know who made the real deal, who didn't. Also do be aware that sometimes, you know, modern manufacturers will buy the rights to historic arsenals and, and use them to, you know, to use, the, um, buy the rights to the name, that is to say. And so, you know, definitely be aware of, of uh, that happening as well. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, number one. So for number two, we have a related uh, phenomenon, but perhaps a little bit trickier. This, of course, is the parts rebuild. As I mentioned in number one, sometimes it's commercially viable to make a new production version, but what's even more commercially viable is if you can purchase a bunch of parts that are ready made for pennies on the dollar because they're old surplus GI, and then produce the bare minimum amount of parts you need to complete the rifle into you know, a full functional uh, firearm. Um, and that was often done. Many M1 carbines, for instance, are this way. Another example that's out there are the uh, Century M1 Garands that had, you know, new cast receivers, but most of everything else was GI surplus parts. And by the way, those have a pretty terrible reputation, so definitely best, best avoided. But um, these can be trickier because if you're looking for manufacturer's marks, they will often have them. And so uh, definitely pay extra attention if you think you're dealing with something along those lines. Uh, but yeah, that's number two. For number three, we have false advertising or the uh, historic context lie. This is going to be a little different than when they tell you that this rifle or handgun or whatever it is was involved in the Battle of Iwo Jima or something like that, and therefore it's more valuable than all the others just like it. That scenario was covered in the previous video. This is a little bit more subtle because it actually assumes you kind of know. You can't prove where a specific firearm has been usually and what it's done. Uh, uh, but basically some firearms are made more valuable by the fact that they're associated with certain historic events or wars. World War II is a very classic example, and ones dated from the war uh, are worth considerably more than ones that were produced well after. Uh, an example of this might be something like the Moss 36 we have in front of us. Uh, 
pre-war and wartime examples are much more valuable than ones that ended up being produced after the war. Another example might be something like German P-38 pistols, which uh, lived on as a design after the war as the P-1, but they're much less valuable than a wartime pistol. And so what you'll see is these advertisers, and they'll say, you know, oh, Moss 36, the uh, French World War II rifle, or, you know, the Walther German World War II pistol. Uh, even though they're clearly looking at a, uh, you know, post-war example. Of course, uh, markings will usually give this away. Oftentimes, firearms are actually marked with the year they were produced, which makes it pretty easy to tell that they couldn't have been from a certain time period. Uh, sometimes they can also be dated using serial numbers and sometimes even features. For instance, there could be a time when they switched from um, machine parts to stamp parts, like on the barrel band on the Moss 36 and some other components as well. In the case of the P-38 pistol, they switched to you know, an aluminum alloy frame, among other changes as well. This stuff you have to be a little bit more careful with because sometimes these parts can be retrofitted, like somebody theoretically could have put, you know, a machined barrel band on this and replaced some of the other components. I don't know how common that is, but I'm sure it does happen. So uh, that's, that's another one to watch out for. For number four, we have fake accessories. Like anything else that you can collect that originally came with accessories, if you have the originals, uh, then it certainly can enhance the value of a firearm. However, some of these accessories, uh, for instance, with um, rifles, it might be something like a sling, a bayonet, ammo pouches, cleaning kits, all sorts. It really tends to vary depending on, on the model. For a pistol, it might be something like a holster, cleaning rod, spare magazine, things like that. Some of these things are actually collector's items in their own right. There are actually... Uh, bayonets out there that are worth just as much if not a little more than the, the rifles they go to because they're so rare um, and so a lot of this stuff does get reproduced there's a lot of stuff out there for which there are actually more fake stuff uh, than real out there anymore and so what you'll often see unfortunately is a rifle that you know may ordinarily sell for something like seven hundred dollars uh, but they'll be listed for $1,100 because it has all the original loadout, but you look at it and it'll be like a, you know, $18 sling and a $40 bayonet and a few other things. And it's really like $80, $90 worth of reproduction uh, accessories. So that's definitely one to watch out for as well. Just be extremely skeptical of accessories in general, especially ones that are very commonly reproduced. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there are ones out there for which there are actually more fake ones out there than real. Um, but yeah, that's now number four. And for number five, we have the deactivated slash demilled firearm. By the way, this isn't one. I'm just using it as a stand-in because, uh, the Enfields are commonly deactivated or demilled. But anyways, uh, for a variety of reasons, a firearm may become permanently deactivated either by a private party or a museum that, you know, wanted it uh, as a display, but wasn't, you know, they weren't comfortable having a live firing firearm on display, or maybe they live in a place where a law would forbid that anyways. Uh, sometimes this was done by governments, uh, you know, they were relegated to say drill and training purposes. This was very commonly done to the infield. So, you know, um, for, for the, uh, the drill purpose rifles, they'll often be marked with some, you know, red stripes right here. And a lot of the components will be stamped with DP for drill purpose. Uh, very, very common. And unfortunately, I have seen people that don't know that this is a, a common occurrence. And I actually know somebody that ended up buying a uh, drill purpose Lee Enfield thinking they got this killer deal. They never heard of the uh, drill purpose rifles. And, you know, later they had to uh, find out that it's not a functional firearm and pretty much can't ever be. So definitely look for those signs. If it's not, uh, if it's not on the infield, that's clearly marked as a drill purpose. Definitely do check, make sure that, for instance, like the bolt head hasn't been cut off or the, the bore is not plugged in some way, you know, either welded shut or something along those lines. Um, there are people who do get stung by that as well. Sometimes they'll be kind of priced right in between what they're actually worth and but you know below what a functional firearm would be worth and so somebody might be thinking oh it's a you know a great deal on that basis uh, only to get stung so um, they could be worth owning some people do you know put these things on display some people use them for uh, parts guns if you you know use some of the non-pressure bearing parts from stuff to, to rebuild uh, it's, it's perfectly viable for that or at least it can be uh, but just Another one to definitely be on the lookout for if you're uh, getting into this stuff. For number six, I actually have two good examples. This, of course, is marketing hype on the part of the importer or retailer, or both. 
So for instance, the top firearm is a Serbian M63 tanker, uh, which was actually produced commercially and not issued to Serbian tank crews as a personal defense weapon. And the bottom one is a paratrooper SKS. It's an SKS with a shorter barrel. Uh, these were not actually issued to Chinese paratroopers. Again, these were also manufactured commercially for sale in the U.S., uh, unfortunately, these names do stick, and sometimes, even to this day, even though they're no longer being imported, you will see these things marketed that way, and somebody might think, though, well, that's pretty cool, and, and pick them up. Uh, just something else to look out for. And thus concludes another one of my thrilling videos. Thank you for watching, as always, and happy collecting.